but we just want to make this conference just awesome. We just want to make it top-notch conference, and so um, they they are a huge blessing to us. They're just here to serve you guys. They're here to serve a generation. So just like how, I mean, it, it's cool to be to be up here speaking. You know, we got Elijah, Seth. I got the opportunity to speak, and Jordan. But the real people, the real famous people are the ones back there where you don't see them. They're back in the kitchen, the volunteers here, the, the people who are serving, not in the limelight, the people back in the media office. Those are the guys we should give it up for, right? Right, guys? Come on, let's give it up for those people. So, so like I said, we got, we're got we going to go into worship here in a little bit. Can I have everybody just stand to your feet? If you want to rush to the front, rush to the front. Come on, we got more rush conference to, to do. Rush to the if front. You're, rush, what she said. We're going to start a rap crew up here. Are you guys stoked? Hey, so last time I had you guys jump up and down, but can I have you guys just sway your hips a little bit? Let's just get funky. Just get, like, start swaying your hips. Come on. There's nobody doing it. Just sway your hips.
hands in a sign of surrender right now. We come up in you, Lord. Have your way in this place. Have your way. Just lift up your own song.
that you've begun. God, I just uh, we just ask you to continue, continue to move in the, in the in the hearts of these young people. Father, we just thank you for breakthrough, revelation, understanding. God, that you're taking us to a, a, a deeper place with you, God. Come on, how many more, how many of you guys want more more of Jesus? Come on. Come on, I'm excited about this next session. So we're going to get right into it. You guys ready for more? Come on. All right, grab, slap a high five on your way back to your seat. And we're going to get rocking. How was lunch? Are your bellies full? Okay, during lunchtime, did it rain out there at all? Yeah. So do you guys get wet? Awesome. So that was like your shower for the day. That's good. You don't even have to take a shower tonight. Um, did you guys all notice the big tent that's out in the field? Okay, that is a no-no zone. Okay, so on our next breaks and stuff, we do really need you guys just to stay away from the big tent. Um, because here at Faith Center Church, we have a Saturday night service. Um, it's a recovery service, and um, uh, Pastor Bill and Vicki Smith run that. And, and it's just an amazing, amazing service where every Saturday night, this place is packed out with 300, 350 people um, who are coming out of the lifestyle of drugs and alcohol. And it is... And, it is. It's, it is absolutely, it has transformed the way our church functions and the way that we think about our community and, and how we help people. Um, because Saturday nights, man, this place is packed, and we, we've been seeing 50 people come to know Jesus every weekend. Come on. Our state-funded programs are bringing, their, bringing these people to church on Saturday nights. And so um, they were gracious enough to, to let us take over the sanctuary tonight. And so that's what the big tent is out there. So tonight... At our six o'clock session, it's, this is really important during um, dinner break, especially. Um, but this place is going to be packed because there's going to be another 350 people showing up for church service out in the field under a tent, and they're going to be doing baptisms and and all kinds of cool stuff. And so, um, yeah. So we just really need to make sure, um, you know, they're doing a really good job to staying out of this space of our conference as, as we're going on. And so we need to do the we need to do just as good a job of staying out of their space. Is that cool? cool so that's why the, we have these doors blocked off that side of the, the building is completely shut down and uh it's gonna be it's gonna be a good night and uh it's really exciting because pastor bill um who runs the exchange service he was a youth pastor for years and uh he's just an incredible pastor and he's gonna be preaching at this conference uh i believe at 2 30 and so i know he's got he, he's kind of giving me a little bit of what he's going to talk about and it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty darn good you're going to like it. Cool. Um, and then right, so that will be our next breakout session is at 2.30 with Pastor Bill. And then um, we're going to have our, our, with the youth in here, and then all the leaders are going to be back in the in the same room, back in the Bible study room uh, with Pastor Elijah Waters. Cool. And then we're going to come back, and Pastor Elijah is just going give it, to give it to us all. Right? He's going to bring it. But right now, I want to invite... Uh, Pastor Elijah to come up on the stage and uh, Pastor Glenn and Theresa our senior pastors cool so um, hopefully you guys got your what? because it's not cold how are y'all doing? Good. So glad to see all of you here. Wow, well, that's too far. I'm married to him, so I can sit closer. Yes, yeah, so this is our amazing Pastor Theresa and Glenn Johnson, our senior pastors here. You guys have been pastoring for what, 50 years? 31 and a half. 31 and a half. Long time. 
yeah. 31 and a half Long years. time. So they are just human beings full of amazing wisdom. And my great friend, Elijah Waters, we go way hey, back. Elijah. Way back, like 10 or 11 years. Or 50 years. Or 50 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's all Botox. Like we, it is. <laughs> we knew each other before we were born. It's crazy. That's a long story, but. Um, so, <laughs> so hopefully you guys got some, we got a lot of good questions, um, um, sent in that we're hopefully going to get to as many, uh, as possible. And, um, so you guys ready? Yeah. You guys like this? You guys all got your notes out and, um, can they still text in questions? Or are they done? Um, yeah, you can, sure. Keep texting them in. <laughs> We'll get to them if we can. There's a bunch on here. Um, I, Heather has the phone somewhere that has all the texts coming in. So, hey, where's Sean? You want to go and grab the phone? Somebody go grab the phone and just get, bring it to me. That'd be fine. So, um, you guys like this stuff, right? Yeah. Getting getting your questions answered, and uh, this is cool. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it. So, um, that's why I invited these guys up here, just because... I'm not as wise as I look. Why are you laughing so hard? Wow. I'm not even trying to be funny. <clears throat> Thanks. That's exactly what Someone why must know Seth really well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll get right into this. So the first question that was uh, texted in, it says, my friend is pursuing me into things that I do not want to do. They have become an atheist. How do I handle this? Real talk. How come I'm first? Ladies are always first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, I think some of it is. First of all, you have to follow. You have to work out your own salvation. The Bible says, and so you. So their person, their friend is following them, or they're an atheist. Say that again. It's the first part of it. Their friend is pursuing them and um, trying to get them to become an atheist. Them into, into things they don't want to do, and they become an atheist. Okay, and they okay. Their friend, I believe. Right. Okay. So. I would say you, first of all, you have to decide, I mean, you have to just fall more and more in love with Jesus. You have to pursue him like that friend is pursuing you for the first thing. And just to realize that when you stand before God on judgment day, God's not going to say, well, I'm sorry, you followed your friend. That's okay. You can come in anyway. He's going to say, you know what? I'm sorry. You did follow your friend. You should have been seeking out and following me, following God instead of following that friend. And so it's really important that you are following the things of God, getting around people that are positive, you know, that are going to be an encouragement uh, to you. One of the scriptures that I've been um, right recently, it's so funny that that would be, I think it's just good with this, that a scripture that I've been praying for some boys and some like um, pastor sons, our son, and just when they're doing good, when they're not doing good, and just as a something to speak over them all the time. And I think this is part of you realize how much God loves you because if God loves you, if you understand that relationship that you have with God, you're going to want to seek to follow him and find out what's pleasing to him, not what's pleasing to your friends. Being a people pleaser and doing all that is not the way to go. It's to be a, a God pleaser first and foremost. And so this verse, um, it's a few verses in um, Isaiah 43, 1 through 7. It's in the message, and I love this verse. It's made me fall in love with God again. I've been born again for 33 years and just fall on un again, but fall in love with him more and more. And that's part of your relationship has to be fresh with God and you have to con continue pursuing him. Okay. So it says, um, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, I will, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God, your personal God, the holy of Israel, your savior. I paid a huge price for you, all of Egypt with Cush and Sebush thrown in. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. Trade the creation just for you. So don't be afraid. I'm with you. Uh, and then it goes on to another part. But if you realize how much God loves you and you want to seek to follow him first and foremost in your life, and just continually, daily fall more and more in love with him, you'll be an influence to that friend that's not following after the things of God. You know, uh, real quick to follow up on what Theresa said, to me, 
when you become a Christian, and I think Jordan was talking about really just going all in for mm -hmm. God, about 98% of all your decisions have already been made once that happens. Um, you, you know, the, the free choice thing is really, it's like, kind of like joining the military. You know, you have a choice whether you want to join the military, but once you join, you are in the yeah. army. I mean, you, it's like, okay, dude, you, now, now we go by our rules. And, and, uh, and God, I, you know, to, to me, it's just a matter of when I got saved, all my friends left me. Every one of them left me. And, and I was just willing to pay that price because I knew he redeemed me that mm -hmm. much and loved me that much. So sometimes, I mean, God will bring you friends even greater than the ones you have now, but you have to trust him. And sometimes faith is saying, look, look God, I'm going to go with you 100% here. And if I can't win these people, then I'm, I'm, I'm choosing not to have a relationship with them because my, my relationship with Jesus is more important. Amen. So good. That's good. Amen. Ditto to all that wisdom sitting right here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and and uh, I don't know if it was Jeannie Mayo or somebody that says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. That's good. And uh, that's tweetable. <laughs> um, you can say I said it if you want, if you're going to tweet it out. Um, and uh, But 1 Corinthians 15, 33, too, bad company corrupts good morals. And I don't know that my first short answer was like, get get some new friends. Mm -hmm. If you got a friend pressure, I think it's the word pressure. If I had a friend that was pressuring me to eat chocolate cake every time I was around them, <laughs> I'd be like, dude, I'm going to be, you know, the half ton man if I keep hanging out with you. I'm, I'm, I need to hang out with some different friends. So I think if a, if a friend is really a friend, they're going to respect you and not press, pressure you. And so, um, yeah, get, get some new friends. Yeah, that's good. I think when your question of how do, how do you really handle that is, you know, with your friends being an atheist and getting pressured and things, if you, like what Theresa's saying, again, if you just really seek first his kingdom, come on, he's got, he's got all the wisdom that you need to handle mm -hmm. any situation. So mm -hmm. focus more on pursuing Jesus and not wondering how to fix a friend. And you don't have to get up and say, I'm not going to hang out with you anymore. You can just slowly start making different choices to just not be available. You don't have to be rude. I mean, we need to show God's love, but we don't have to be rude. Yeah. You know you don't have to re reply to every text message, right? <laughs> no. Oh, I missed that. All right. Um, there's a, deba a debate at school on creation versus evolution. It's always a big deal. What should I say to defend creation? Books or anything that you can recommend? Yeah, there's, a, I mean, I think you mentioned one. Uh, Evidence that Demands a Verdict uh, is a good book. It's very deep and thick and, and intense. But I, I would encourage all of you really, you know, if you, just walk up to them and say this. Uh, when they talk about evolution, just walk up and say, well, isn't that, the, isn't that against the second law of thermodynamics? And then you sound really smart, see? The second law of thermodynamics basically says that nothing in this world gets better on its own. If you put a car out in the parking lot and sits there for 100 years, does it get better on its own? Does it, get, does it, does it turn into something better on its own? It gets worse. Everything in this world, the second law of thermodynamics, everything gets worse. Nobody can argue that law. Nobody can argue that law. So just walk out there. If you don't know any other law, just say, isn't that against the second law of thermodynamics? And then walk off. Yep. Just tell them to Google it's it. Good. It's too deep for them. Yep. <laughs> or watch God is Not Dead. That's a great movie to help yeah. you with that. Yeah. God, it's a great movie. Study, 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 yes. study, study. Okay, here's a good one. How do, you, how do we know that we are the right religion? I believe is what they're trying to say. Because we are. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> we said so. Yeah, pray and ask Jesus if we're the right religion. See what he says. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good question that a lot of young people are asking, though. Uh -huh. And I think, I, I think it's okay to ask questions like that. Are we the right totally. religion? And, and what, am I believing this because my parents believe it? And, uh, you know, and I think I went through a season like that at 15, 16 years old where I decided to kind of search things out and learn more about my faith and learn more about how the Bible came together and proofs of the resurrection and all those types of things. And, and, um, and so uh, the, the one thing I love about Christianity that separates it from every other religious belief system in the world is every other religion focuses on what you have to do. You have to do something in order to achieve a reward, an afterlife, something. Christianity is the only belief system that doesn't focus on do, but focuses on done, what's already been done. Put your trust in what's already been done. There's nothing that you can do. 
Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to fathom that. It's hard to comprehend the idea of grace because it's, it's a free gift. Um, but that's, uh, that's pretty mind-blowing. And, and, and I think if you're on that journey, um, yeah, continue to pray, continue to, you know, read up on things. I think that's okay. Um, and it doesn't have to be just kind of a blind faith. Well, I guess I just got to believe that Christianity is the right, the right thing. Again, the book that Pastor referenced, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, Josh McDowell wrote that book when he was in college as an atheist trying to disprove God. And in the, in the context of his thesis of trying to disprove the existence of God, he ended up getting saved as he did research. So if that tells you anything, um, a lot of people think, man, the more you explore science and the more you explore things, the more, you know, ooh, it, you know, the more it, it, it disproves God. No, actually science more and more, they're proving how complex life is and it's actually disproving evolution. More and more technology we have is actually, um, you know, blowing more holes in all the other theories and and uh, and making people realize there is a creator. There is God is real. Jesus is real. You know, I was thinking about the term religion too, though. I think that, yeah. you know, really it really comes down to we don't care what you label it as long as Jesus is your savior. And so whether it's you know, I mean, really, I mean, it's. A lot of these things are just preference, really. But as long as Jesus is Lord, that's the key, really. I mean, if we're talking about the difference between Jesus and Buddha, well, okay, but if we're talking the difference between Baptist and Pentecostal, we all have Jesus in mind. Be, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. So, Good. Um, here's one that says, how do you get your friend to come to church? Anybody have that problem? You want a friend to come to church? And it's like, no. Park there. Park there. <laughs> Elijah, what would you say to that? Just keep, you know, keep inviting them. I, I think, too, the more, it's not just about inviting them and being kind of a squeaky wheel or, or being annoying, but I think, too, just the more you continue to demonstrate what true love is, you continue to demonstrate to true joy, you demonstrate um, the changed life that's happened to you since you've been coming to church. I think that's the best uh, marketing we have. That's better than a tweet or an invite card is what they see on your life, you know? And, uh, and so just continue to live, live the life for Jesus, pray for him, you know? And, uh, and don't stop inviting them, you know? I've had friends that have come to church after inviting them. It's taken a couple years of inviting. And then one day they're like, okay. I'm like, wait, what? You said no 50 times. <laughs> But you just never know that one day where they're just in a hurting place and they're like, okay, you know what? I'll come to church with you tonight. And so, um, so don't, ever, don't ever stop. That's good. Yeah, and if, if you don't have a testimony or you don't have a Twitter or you don't know how to pray, a um, highly effective way is duct tape, uh, trunk. Um, you just, you just t tape them up, throw them in your trunk, make them come with you. Um, no, I've heard, I've heard some cool stories of that, you know, kids just kind of tricking their friends. Hey, you want to come spend the night? Sure. Oh, yeah, we got to go to youth group tonight. Or, you know, that, that re really, that's like, that's the, uh, did that happen to you? You've been thrown in a trunk or in tricks? That, that, that must be her story. <laughs> I don't know. That's why I'm um, here right now. <laughs> but really, it's always that first time is always the scariest for your friends. And so, you know, uh, if, if an necessarily inviting them it isn't isn't working all the time bring them pick them up how many of you how many of you though like this conference and the music and the lights see your friends have this vision of what church is and if they could if you could get them here they go oh my god are you kidding me and but you got to get them past that and and if your youth group is oh my god why are they coming then we got to probably got to change something but but the reality is, I think people, once you get them in the door and expose them to cool, that church can be cool. And man, there was no, there was no such thing as cool church when I was growing up. I mean, there was no such thing. They, they didn't, I don't cool, think cool churches invited, did not exist in the world when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah. Cool didn't come around until like the 80s or 90s. Um, <laughs> Uh, here's a great question. Um, is it bad that I'm almost 18 and haven't had a boyfriend? No. <laughs> so bad. No, no, it's not. <laughs> you should write a book is what yeah, you should do. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> That's awesome. You just have to stay focused on what you want for um, 
for a husband because I think dating, having a boyfriend and breaking up, having a boyfriend and breaking up is just showing you how to get in and out of relationships and basically seeds a divorce for later on. It's easier for you to do it. And so by you compromising and having a boyfriend or a girlfriend just to have a boyfriend or girlfriend to be cool is not cool. And it's we we dated in high school before we were born again. We had lots of relationships before we were born again, got into lots of trouble and really wish wish to God we could erase all those memories and start all over again. Because those things have left scars in our hearts from bad relationships and from bad things that have happened or that we did. And so for you to stay pure and to not think that you have to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend is the best thing you can possibly do because you're not going through those emotional roller coasters and that will leave marks later on in your life. And so you just stay called to what God's called you to do. There's plenty of time to date. There's plenty of time to have a relationship. And even just go about your business, and when God will bring that right person along, when you're in your 20s, your 30s, then go for those those relationships. But you, And even that, you be cautious of who you're dating as well. Stay around friends that are going to help you to decide whether or not those are good people to have in your life. Because I think what happens a lot of times is you start dating, then you isolate from your friends. You isolate from people that are going to say, this person's not a good person in your life, and we won't listen to them because we get caught up in all kinds of things. So it's better off not to date and to really stay in doing group settings, get together with a bunch of friends. There's no reason you can't have a whole bunch of friends together hanging out and going having a good time and not do the relationship thing all the time little little thought and advice too because like I say we we got into you know we were non-christians and so we dated as non-christians did everything that non-christians do and then we broke up and went our separate ways got saved little practical advice though I noticed with I noticed with you young people this is, happens with everybody is uh, when you're dating keep yourself upright <laughs> now that may sound funny to you but as the relationship grows, it seems like people just want to start just, they want to just kind of keep tipping over to a place where next thing you know, you're, you're laying down. Not good. No, I'm serious. I am serious. I've observed it from every young person I know. They start off or like even this adults. and they, they're hugging. The next thing you know, they're starting to slide down. And <laughs> next thing Preach. you know, man, they are, they are their heads on the, on the couch and they're laying on each other. And it's like, we got a problem right now. Mm-hmm. Everybody say, keep yourself upright. <laughs> keep yourself upright. Because <laughs> Theresa and I wish we would have kept ourselves upright when we were in high school, you know, so. They're all like, uh, yeah. They're, yeah, they're just uh, now getting it. They're like, this is pure conference. <laughs> oh, my God. There's a reason we call it pure. My mind. <laughs> boys are icky. All the girls say boys are icky. All the girls say... Boys are icky. Did I say that right? I messed it up. Whatever. Whatever no. you aren't, you're say too that old. One's icky. You're too old for that, baby. <laughs> boys, boys have cooties, and girls are just crazy, and they take all your money. Yep. They're emotional and all Park that. There. Just Park remember there. that. That'll preach. We're good with going. that. <laughs> We're good with that. Whatever to keep you out of those relationships. <laughs> um, let's see here. What is your favorite book in the Bible? Mine depends on what time, what day, what, what I'm going through in life. So it changes all the time. I mean, I have favorite books, but there's lots of them. Like Genesis to like Revelations are my favorite. <laughs> Not very picky. <laughs> I, I think my favorite verse is Romans 5:17, yep, which will reign in verses. life by one Jesus Christ. But that's just the way we built our lives off of. Mm -hmm. But I don't have a favorite either. Just. I'm kind of partial to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. so. Whatever is going to help me be better, that's yeah. my favorite verse. Yeah. And it depends on what stage you're at in your life. If you want to, want to hear about grace, read Romans. And, you know, you want to hear about the church, read Ephesians. And you don't want to hear about miracles, read Acts. And, you know, different things like that. So, mm -hmm. I love Psalms. Psalms are good. Or too. Psalms, however you want to pronounce Psalms. it. Psalms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because David is so real, you know what I mean? He's like mm -hmm. praising God, and then he's like yelling at God, and he's like frustrated, and he's awesome. I don't know. I just think it's, it's, it's comforting to me, mm -hmm. you know, to, um, to hear how David talks to God and the songs he sings. And I like the Psalms. Yeah, I like, I like David. Leviticus. 
I'm just Leviticus. <laughs> is that a book in the Bible? Yeah. It sounds like a disease. <laughs> it's like when you can't sleep at night. You, you have Leviticus? You find Leviticus. You have a Leviticus. <laughs> Ew. Leviticus? <laughs> you got a, get, Seth's got a case of Leviticus. <laughs> got a case of Leviticus. <laughs> Contracted Leviticus. Uh, Does your wife know? Yes. <laughs> How can you tell the difference between your conscience and the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Boom. Well, I think, this is my own doctrinal belief, that if a person is serving God, filled with the Spirit, walking with God, then your conscience can be influenced by the Holy Spirit. And I really believe that your conscience is the voice of your spirit. As a matter of fact, I mean, I, I don't know how to, I mean, it's really a theological definition here. But really, to me, um, a theological def definition is the Holy Spirit really speaks to our spirit, and our spirit speaks to us. And so I think you, letting your conscience be your guide. If you're born again, recreated, born again human spirit, then you can let your conscience be your guide, because I think the Holy Spirit influences your conscience, in my opinion. And I think I can bear that out scripturally, too. So... Um, nothing wrong with your conscience ruling you. It's, it's, I think that a lot of people misinterpret conscience for condemnation. And there's a big difference between those two. Conscience is something, your conscience will always you know, keep you out of robbing a gas station. But condemnation will condemn you and tell you that you're no good. Your conscience will never speak outside of the word of God if it's born again. So just filter that through. I think you have to filter that through the word of God. That God's always for you, not against you. It's good. Yeah, I would just say make sure you, you really test it and compare it with what the word of God says. You know, because if you feel like your conscience is telling you you need to date that guy so that he can get saved and know Jesus, <laughs> then you probably just need to realize that's not... It's your flesh. That's your hormones. <laughs> you, need to go, you need to go for a jog. <laughs> <laughs> you need to go lift some weights, go for a run, right? Pick up knitting. Um, you know, stop shaving your legs. So, Seth, you don't believe in flirt to convert? You don't, you know? I mean, is that cool? Or? Um, you know, over the years... Sean, Sean used to have that policy before Natalie, I think, you know? <laughs> I did kind of just look at him. <laughs> No, I was going to say, over the years, you know, that is a very popular thing um, amongst Christian young people, and it never works. Mm -mm. Never works, so that's funny. You flirt to convert. So, yeah, just really, you, you, have, you have the Bible, which is truth, and, and, and I know as young people, you're, it, it is, it's confusing. We know what is the Holy Spirit. You're learning what the voice of God feels like, sounds like uh, in your life, and what's, what's me, what's God, and and I think for me, that was always just go back to the word is, you know, is my thoughts about myself biblical? Are they what God thinks about me? If not, then I know that it's not the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, <clears throat> is it bad to listen to secular music? Is it, is it bad? I, I hope not. Elijah, you might want to answer that one because we probably do. <laughs> do <you want> <laughs> I, was like, I don't yeah, know if you want to my answer. <laughs> don't listen to it. It's from the devil. <laughs> you know, let me say this too, and then I'll let Elijah uh, speak. But um, when we first got saved, we were like, burn every album, uh, don't listen to anything. And actually, I think that really helped me, mm -hmm. to be honest with you, because my music. My younger, in your younger years. Yeah, younger years my music was connected to my old life. Mm -hmm. And so I had, when I broke my old life, I, I had to break that old life, otherwise it brought me back in. So now I've had to rebuy all of those albums that I destroyed, I got rid of now. <laughs> but the reality is though, is we, didn't, we don't even know what, we don't know any, out, we don't know any bands from the 80s because we did not listen to secular music because we were establishing our Christian life. It was more important. So I don't think it's wrong unless it triggers something that leads to your, right. your old life. And, and if you just, what, you, you are what you eat. So if you just have a steady diet, that's all you listen to. I, if you all you listen to is country music, you're going to become really strange. You know? <laughs> you're going to be crying all the time. You know? Be I depressed. Mean, just depressed all the time. Yeah. 
I love country music. I love, I'm a Led Zeppelin guy. I love all that stuff. But, um, but for me, I think it really helped us as long as it, it I had to do that for, to get off of my old lifestyle. That's, that was be my answer. So. Well, I think it's, does it make you angry like, or does it make you sad? So what does that music do to you? Why do you have to listen to that? Or why do you choose to listen to that type of music? I used to, I know it's not the right terminology, but Joel used to always listen to what I call screaming memes and just the screaming, yelling, the hardcore, can't understand anything they're saying, but there's just so much anger in it. You know, and it's like, I, I could listen to it for a little bit, but if I'm in traffic, it's like, I'm gonna hit somebody, just turn it off. You know, so what does it stir? <laughs> exactly. That's a popular song. <laughs> but By the way, I just said Jesus loves me. <laughs> I felt but what that. What does it stir up? <laughs> I felt the, the presence, like, yeah, it was holy. Oh. Yep. So what does it stir up? Well, this is kind of a. I got to be careful. This is a soapbox for me, because I don't even like the term secular because it's not found in the Bible. And when people ask me, do you listen to secular music? I ask them, do you watch secular TV shows? Is that a secular shirt you're wearing? Is this a secular microphone? Is this a secular coffee? Like, why do we put that label on music and we condemn people that listen, but the latest movie, you, you went and watched Captain America. It's like, was that written by Christians? Was the Disney yeah. Channel shows you, you yeah. watched written by Christians? It's like, why, why are we picking on music? And, I, and so I have a, so everybody in, in the, all my interns know they didn't, never use the word secular around me because I go off. But um, I, I just, I think there's good music and there's bad music. And I, I think Paul talks about this. He says everything is permissible, but not everything's beneficial. And he talks about it related to food that's offered up to idols. And he's talking about food issues in the New Testament. But it goes along with what pastor is saying. You know, I think um, everybody's different. And... Uh, and, and so I, I think that there's, um, I, I would never put a label and say, don't listen to secular music or don't listen to music that is this or that. I think there's music out there that's really good, that's inspiring, that um, inspires creativity and uh, music that has a really positive message, um, whether it's written by a Christian or not. I, I, I took issue with this years ago because I've started to get involved with music. I met Christian bands that have music on Christian radio stations who live a insanely godless life. I had a Christian band at a Christian concert uh, ask my wife to come on their bus to basically have sex with them. And I realized there's people, there's, there's songs that we listen to that are, that are about Jesus, but the people that wrote them aren't living necessarily a lifestyle that lines up with Jesus. Then there's other people that, uh, there's, I've met artists that are writing songs that have nothing to do with God, but they love Jesus with their whole heart. And so how... I just think we got to be careful when we right. throw things into our nice little compartments and boxes and say this is good and this is not good. And so it comes back to the conscience thing. Let the Holy Spirit, who's in your, con you know, talk to you about what music's going to be good for you and what's not going to be good for you. And I don't think it needs to be a secular versus Christian thing. That's yeah. good. That's good. That's what I would have said. <laughs> so... Yeah, you guys, you just got to be smart. It's like if you are coming out of a, a promiscu uh, promiscuous background, as an example, um, you're not going to be one of listening to Beyonce, <laughs> you know, that are, is the, are sexual songs that you're, you're trying to break that type of a, a lifestyle or come out of that lifestyle. Um, it is. It's, a, it's what you put in your ear is going to create who you become. You know, for me too, now music was so much a part of my life that I can relate sin, times of major sin in my life to certain yeah. songs. Yeah. And when I hear those on the radio, they trigger a thought process of what I was doing that night yep. 35, 40 years ago. So for me, it's about triggers and things. So what we had to just dump it all for us but like I said now I you know I mean I, I, I just you know you just have to filter that I guess and I don't I don't want to listen to anything that's not that is you know downgrades God or you know isn't glorifying to God I'm not gonna listen to anything like that but there's certainly some great love songs out there and great great music out there great stuff let's I mean stairway to heaven was no I'm just kidding no. <laughs> never mind <clears throat> 
You know, do you have you guys ever heard have you guys ever heard of backward masking? How many of you have ever heard of that? So I didn't believe this, but when we're in the, All the old people raised their yeah. hands. When we're in the now we had what we call records. records. Have you ever seen what a record is? Record player. But this this is funny, and I'll just throw this in as kind of a kind of a laugh now, but Stairway to Heaven, there's a certain part in Stairway to Heaven. If you put the needle on that record and and I did it myself and spin it backwards with your finger. It says, oh, my sweet Satan, he's the one who makes me sad. It's on there. I've done it with my own album. It's now, like a Ouija board on a record. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what that means or anything like that. I mean, I'm trying to put it through. But I've done it myself. And it's like, no way. I, I, I didn't believe all these just crazy Christians. Just do it backwards. <laughs> yeah. But that's what, so what that means, probably nothing. But I think it was probably to the mystique of some of that stuff back then. But anyway, just thought I'd throw that in. So for whatever reason. <laughs> Um, how should I treat someone who says they are a Christian, but they don't go to church and don't live like a Christian? Say the first part. How should I treat someone who says they are a Christian, but they don't go to church and don't live like a Christian? Your fruit doesn't say you are. Well, it doesn't. That's not the question. How do you treat them? How do you treat them? Treat them nice. You just be kind to them. Walk in love. <laughs> what, I mean, what, I mean are, are we asking... To go get in their face, I don't think I'd do that. Just, you know, I mean, yeah. I would say if they say they're a Christian, they don't live like a Christian. They don't go to church. They're not a Christian. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm, I'm a I'm an NFL football player, but I don't belong on a team. I can't catch a football. I'm not a I'm not a football player. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so you have to treat them like they're not a Christian. And again, you, you love them, and and uh, you would love them just like you would. You're called to love everybody. I grew up and I was a Christian, but I wasn't a born again Christian. But I said I was a Christian because I wasn't a Catholic or I wasn't a Baptist, and so it was just the I guess the I wasn't a Pentecostal or um, Presbyterian. I was a Christian, and so sometimes I think maybe they don't understand what that really means because I think. A Christian is being Christ-like, and so we're trying to emulate what Christ wants us to do here on earth and be like him and being kind and showing compassion and helping others, being a disciple and um, ministering to other people. So it's the fruit of, fruit of being a Christian is doing something. It's not just saying I am. And just or, be kind to or just them. disciple them. Mm -hmm. Treat them like they are a Christian. Yeah, but treat them and say, hey, let's well, you're a Christian, let's together. go to Bible study. Yep, exactly. Then they will, might just become a Christian. Mm-hmm. You gotta be sneaky. Very, very sneaky. Um, how do you how do I know I have done something right in God's eyes? Yeah. How do you know that what you're doing right is right in God's eyes? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think probably in my just first thing that comes to me is is um, maybe the person that asks this question is is maybe trying to you know doesn't understand grace because we're trying to do something right in God's eyes. I'm, I mean, you know, I mean, there's a scripture that talks about being well pleasing to the Lord, being fruitful in every good work, being well pleasing to the Lord. But you know, without faith, it's impossible to please Him. He that cometh to God must believe that He is. He's a reward of those that diligently seek Him. Hebrews chapter eleven verse six. I think probably the word describes a lot of this stuff is I mean the, you know but I think overall just kindness is probably a godly trait just being kindness and you know kind and different things like that but there's a lot of things we please God because the Bible says we're doing this you know faith pleases God so if we're in faith we please God well it doesn't always feel like it but we do so but I don't know I'm not sure I quite get the question but anybody else ask God <laughs> Does it line up with the word? Is it doing what the word tells us to do? I mean, is it a kind thing you're doing? I mean, I don't, I'm almost, I don't want it to be that we're, that you're trying to set up what you're doing, you know, but it's just, if down inside of you, does it feel right or does it feel wrong? Allow that conscience to be your guide. Allow that, you know, that's inside of you, that still small voice, because we know when we're doing something that's not right. And so really listen to that. 
you know, even when I wasn't walking with God, there was that voice that said, Theresa, this is not right. What are you doing here? And we can sear that and make it where it's um, quiet, quieter in our life by, by us continually doing the wrong thing. But if we just say, Father God, help me to know if this is the right thing to do and just constantly live by that and just let him be your guide, let him be your conscience, he'll help you on those decisions to know if that's a right thing to do. Um, okay, here's a, here's a good one. How do you deal with forgiving people and letting go of an angry situation? That's a good question. Usually, because I know Sean just taught on forgiveness, and mm -hmm. every time I've taught on forgiveness or done a series on it, this is always a question that, that comes up is, how do you deal with, how do you really forgive people and let go, fully let go of a situation that brings anger? Sometimes it's a daily thing. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. Sometimes it's a daily thing that you have to walk in forgiveness with those people. Um, there's been times, there's been situations in my life that it wasn't forgiving somebody else, it was forgiving myself. And so I would just have to get scriptures that talked about that God forgive me, that he throws those sea, things into the sea of forgetfulness, that as far as the east is the west, he forgives me. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He loves me no matter what. And so just meditating on those things and building that up inside of me to realize that that I can walk in forgiveness or just saying daily when that person's um, name comes up or when you think of that person's name, just say, Father God, I forgive that person. I'm walking by faith because I really in my flesh do not forgive that person. I want to hurt them. And just you just constantly saying, Father God, I forgive them. I forgive them because that forgiveness does not hurt them. It hurts you. And it holds you, unforgiveness, sorry, that unforgiveness holds you in that in a place. There's a friend of mine that says, Give, having unforgiveness in our heart is like renting a part of your heart to the devil, that he has control of that unforgiveness. And we don't want him to have any part of us and have that control. And so we want to walk with God. And so just continue to just lift them up and say, Father God, I forgive them. I forgive myself or forgive the person or whatever. So and continue. Great. Yeah, I, I would... Absolutely agree with that, and I think I think the biggest thing that helped me. I had to go through this with my own father many years ago, learning how to forgive somebody that had hurt me and my family really, you know, for several years. And God helped me realize every day I was rehearsing how much God forgave me, and that if um, you know, you've probably heard preachers say it. If you could put all your sins of your whole life, you know, in in a you know, in a manuscript, how thick would that manuscript be? You know, like how many sins have we committed against God? He forgives every single one of them, past, present, future sins. I mean, it's literally his blood forgive, you know, he's forgiven us. And so that revelation is like, who am I to hold a handful of things against my dad or against anybody? Um, and there's a parable, a parable of the unforgiving servant. I think it is that kind of talks about that. And, uh, and just realizing that forgiveness is a choice, not a, not a feeling. You're, you're going to feel angry. Yeah. And um, I, I thank God that, that Jesus didn't decide to go through with Calvary based on a feeling. Because after the first <laughs> nail, he would have been like, no, nope, hey, time out. Let's call yeah. this off. Yeah. You know, we're, uh, I'm good, you know. But, uh, but it, was, it was a decision of the will. And uh, he said, forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. And... Uh, and so I think it's the same with us. I think God gives us the strength based on how much he's forgiven us. He gives us the strength and the power to forgive other people that have hurt us and done terrible things to us. And us forgiving them doesn't condone what they've done. It doesn't let them off the hook. It lets us off the hook. Um, and, uh, and so you don't, God never intended for you to live, you know, a day of your life in a place of bitterness and resentment and anger. Uh, you can get out of that prison of anger and resentment right now by choosing to forgive. And what's helped me is just remembering, wow, God, you, you forgave me when I didn't deserve forgiveness. So who am I to hold that against anybody else? Good. One last thing on that, Seth, is forgiveness doesn't equal fellowship. Because forgiveness of a person that abused you does not mean you have to go to them and have fellowship with them ever again. It just means you forgave them right. and you release that in, the, in your heart. It doesn't equate to fellowship. It may, like probably in the case of Elijah and his father, probably equate to fellowship, but it doesn't necessarily and doesn't have to equate to fellowship with that person or talking to that person. That's good. I think, uh, too, you know, we have the, the communion. I think 
you know, we, we, we take communion and we just think that, okay, it's all over. All of a sudden, you're going to be completely fine. And communion, I think, is just an act of faith saying, I'm going to forgive. But the, the anger part is an emotion. That's what's going to have the triggers. And from the memories or the, you know, whatever the, that trigger is. And I think that once you begin to, you know, really, um, if you're praying for the person, you know, if you really want to forgive someone, um, but you can't pray for them, you know, you still need to work on some stuff. You know, praying for that person will help heal you to get to a place because when you pray for that person, you're going to have the heart, you're going to, you're going to have the heart of God for that person. Right. And, uh, and so you'll be able to see the whole situation. That's what's going to bring healing to those emotions that keep bringing you back to the unforgiveness thought process, right? So just be pray, praying for them and, and, and realize that there's a process that you're gonna, it goes through of changing the, the triggers or the emotions to it. Um, here's a big question. What does the Bible say about gays and lesbians? It's a big question to, in today's society. Well, let me start and then let these guys jump in. Um, one of the things that I have, this is, and understand this, and this is a big question about, is the church against gays and lesbians? You know, my brother's a, a gay, flaming, on fire, go to the parades, gay guy in in uh, New York City. And um, I think in all my years, I've been in this 31 years now, pastor in the same church, been born again about 34 years, something like that, 34, 35 years. Never heard a sermon against gay people. Now, you would think from the news media that the church is preaching against this all the time. But for me, I mean, there's so much scriptural basis. I mean, Romans chapter 1, all through the Old Testament, many things Paul said. Um, condemns the gay lifestyle. I believe the Bible is very clear about that. However, I, I, I hate the fact that I get put into a box and says, if you disagree with my life, then you hate me. I absolutely love my brother. And I absolutely, there's no, I, I love everybody. There, I mean, I'd rather, I just, we want to, we want to talk it. Why can't we disagree with somebody's lifestyle and without hating, without saying we hate? I mean, I think we get put into that, that box. And, um, and for me, the whole thing about the whole gay issue for me is people say they're born that way. Well, and I don't mean to, and forgive me when I'm saying this, but then the, then the bisexual says, well, I was born that way. So now with gay marriage, should we allow now people to marry two people? And, and I know this sounds really strange, really weird, but we don't think these through. The pedophile thinks he was born that way. So how, where, does it, where does it all stop? And my whole thing is, I want in churches right now, I, we were talking about this the other day, and right now, I think at any given time, there's, I can count nine openly gay people that come to our church. And, you know, and then they get wind that maybe I'm not a, for their lifestyle, and then they leave or whatever. Cause I'm, but I, I really love these people. I, I'm absolutely head over heels in love with these people. But I'm not in favor of adultery. I'm not in favor of gossip. I'm not in favor of... of um, you know, greed, I'm not, and I'm not in favor of a gay lifestyle, but to me, they're all in the same category, but I think what happens is the world puts us in the box and says, this is greater than those, and, and I don't like being put in that box, because I look at sin all the same, and I absolutely am in love with, with people, no matter what their situation is, and, and welcome in our church anytime, um, because I believe the Holy Ghost can do something amazing and transform people's lives we're all about transformation we want people to become better and so no matter where you're at in your life whether you know what doesn't matter we want you to become better for who God wants you to be and who God's created you to be and so it's just walking that walk and just to realize that that God loves you God doesn't care I mean he does care where you're at because he wants you to become better and so it's just working on that all the time I have to work on that all the time we all need to work on that all the time and so it's just fall in love with God more and more and more. And I think sometimes it's a, a lack of a revelation of who God is in your life. Or because of, you know, one of the things that they talk about is 
issues with parents or you didn't bond with your parent or you know all those things and and those are such huge issues in today's society that are really sad but there's people that get into drugs and stuff because of that as well and so no matter what has caused those issues in your relation in your life we want you to be better in those relationships and just to have God's perspective yeah no I, I agree um, I, I, I'm really grieved that I think for some Christians and some churches uh, the homosexual lifestyles become the modern-day leprosy I think I think we, we kind of want to push them out their outcasts and what did Jesus do with the lepers um, he, he reached his hand out and uh, and so yeah and I think it's sad we, we want to pick on that more than we want to pick on um, you know pornography disobedience to parents. I mean you understand disobedience to parents is in the same sentence in Romans 1 as homosexuality I think the question was what does the Bible say about it and the Bible makes it clear and it's not just an Old Testament reference for those of you that are like well that's Old Testament it's what about Jesus well there's New Testament references about homosexuality um, and uh, but it but it's it's usually in a list of things um, and for some reason we, we like to pick on that one a lot and we have a lot we have a campus in Los Angeles we have a lot more than nine openly gay uh, people one of our most faithful guys is on the front row every week married to another guy in Beverly Hills and loves Jesus with his whole heart and uh, you know everybody's on a journey and we let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit We're, I'm not gonna be the Holy Spirit I'm gonna continue we're gonna continue to preach Jesus and, and I think that's part of it too what pastor's saying as well let's, let's not be people let's not be churches that preach what we're against but what we're for let's preach Jesus and continue to focus people to Jesus and let let uh, everybody's journey is different and the timing of people in their journey is different and uh, and so um, we have people that have been coming for you know several months and they're as far as I know still living a gay lifestyle but they're loving Jesus and they're in our small groups and they're learning more about God and they really want to um, love God and, and, and I'm, I'm absolutely theologically convinced Jesus loves homosexuals so why why wouldn't why wouldn't I why wouldn't we um, so thank God that we he doesn't put us in our categories for what we struggle with and the issues that we have but we're just all on the same level man God loves right. us all so let's let's just do the same sin is sin there is a but there is a sin that um, the Bible talks about a sin of the flesh it's the it's a different it's different than not judge differently or anything like that but you know you can like if I was a pastor and I was and I was bilking money from the church, okay, yeah, that guy's kind of crooked, you know. But if I commit adultery, my life's over with, because there's a sin of the flesh, and there, and there's something about men judge sins of the flesh differently than we judge sins of the flesh. That I'm not saying it's worse or better or anything like that, but there's a sin of the flesh. So it's a sin against our own body that is different than any other sin, and and so. But I personally think that we. I don't, and I don't think I don't even think the church does. But I think that we we somehow the, the people perceive us, gay people perceive us as that we're judging them, and and I, I I don't think we do. I think I think wrong judges them. You know, just the you know just like adultery or anything else. I think wrong judges them, and all people are welcome at Faith Center Church. We want you here, man. We absolutely love you and want you at Faith Center Church, no matter what your situation Amen. is. So. And I think there's a, there are churches that, like we've kind of talked about, that say they're not welcome, and we're about people. We want you to be a better person and in your life, and so we welcome everybody to come in. Next one. Um... Is it okay to kiss and not touch? <laughs> are we talking about your brother or your sister? Or what are you? Yeah, touch what? Mm, touch shoulders. What? Mm. Um, I think that if you think that you can kiss and not touch, you're a fool. Because you might be able to do that once, but uh, it, is a, it is a progression of emotions and chemical reactions that that God put in our body to have with our our married spouse, mm -hmm. and um, oh, it's just a kiss or it's just holding hands. It's um, you're probably 
too young to be kissing anyways. <laughs> we can tell by the text. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, it's okay to like kiss your parents. That's what I tell my daughters. <laughs> Seth, uh, God intended our lives to, you know, when we get married, our, intended our lives to come together. And on this line of getting, uh, 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 on this line of growing together, you put a male and a female together, they will start developing intimacy with one another. I mean, they'll start talking. And on that line, somewhere down the road, sex will be involved on that line somewhere down the road. Whether you're married, not married, wherever, if you're allowed to, to be together, sex will happen in that relationship 99.9% .9 of the time. So when you, it's so important that you guys figure out this out real quick that, you know, you have to, somewhere down the road, you have to say, I can't get involved, I, I can't do certain things, I can't touch physically and so on and so forth because God designed you to have sex after that, eventually. He designed it that way. But he wants to, to be interrupted with a marriage in between there. But it's very important, just because you're married, if you work with somebody of the opposite sex and you start talking to them and fellowshipping with them, you're, you're on your way to the same relationship that you had with your, with your spouse. That's why... We do not allow that type of relationships around. We, there's no such thing as my best friend is not a woman. I don't even have a friend that is a woman that I'm going to hang out with and talk to on the phone. I, it doesn't exist because of the natural progression that happens with that. It doesn't make me evil. It makes me on the track that God wants me on. But you have to have that track be a moral track as you go down that road. And so Therese and I do not have friends that are women or guys outside of our relationship that we talk to on the phone. Now we have acquaintances and co-workers and things like that that we talk to and things like that. But even with my co-workers, uh, my female co-workers, we never allow our conversation to go below a ministry level and without Theresa in the room. Our, my conversation never goes below a ministry level. Never talks about family. We don't talk about husband and wife relationships unless Theresa's in the room. That's when the conversation can go below a ministry level because co communication equals intimacy, and intimacy eventually leads to sex, whether you're married or not. There's many, many pastors that have bitten the dust over the years because they started counseling somebody, and they got on that godly track with an with a immoral, immoral um, uh, not, they didn't start off that way, but you will have sex down the road somewhere. So you have to watch yourself. And sex counts as touching. Yes, <laughs> sex does count as touching, yeah. So, I don't know. It, for me, I go ahead, man. I don't. Know. We have a friend long time ago. I spoke gave, too long, so you're you fine. Know. We have a friend that long time ago gave this advice. He says, "Don't yell, help me, Jesus, when the windows are all steamed up." Okay. It's like you're a little late then, so just don't even get to that point. Just don't go down that road. Well, let me add to that. He always said, "Keep your tongue in your mouth, <laughs> and don't yell, help me, Jesus, when the windows are already steamed up." Mm -hmm. That was his two. That was a pastor friend of ours. Yeah. He's dead now. <laughs> so that's what happens when you die. You die. You die. Don't touch or you'll die. <laughs> Are we almost done here? Or I think so. Yeah, we just have a few more minutes. I want it. I know this this phone has been blowing up since here it comes another one. Um, so we're probably not gonna be able to get to these. Sorry, but I want to end on this last one here. Um, if we have had sex before marriage, does God look down upon us? Mm. Look down on us? Well, of course not. God he looks doesn't. down on you from heaven, but not down <laughs> on you for what you've done. God doesn't. The, the promises of God are for two reasons. To protect you or to provide for you. Now, Therese and I both had relationships that weren't healthy because we were non-Christians. And... I think that we have to constantly battle, in my mind, it's a constant battle to not have flashbacks from those unhealthy relationships. And God, God, wants, you to, God wants you to celebrate with one person your whole life and enjoy life. And God's not like, well, he's trying to spoil my fun. No, he's trying to protect you right. or provide for you. Mm -hmm. Protect you or provide for you. Mm -hmm. 
and leave it at that. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's very good. Yeah, amen to all that. God doesn't look down on on anybody because of because of sin, you know. And uh, in Christ, you're a new creation. Mm -hmm. So God, you got to remember, God doesn't even, even when you're rehearsing that. Oh, I, but I had premarital sex, or I'm not a virgin. God's like, what? Wait, what are you talking about? And he threw that in the sea of forgetfulness. God, who knows everything. Mm -hmm has chosen to forget one thing, your sin. Mm -hmm. And so think about that. And that's pretty amazing, you know what I mean? So uh, so regardless of your testimony or, or your past, uh, you're a new creation in Christ. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and know that God wants the best for you too. I think when I started dating, who's now my wife, when we were dating, she had, she had not ever even kissed anybody. I had messed up and had several bad relationships. And I remember the whole time I felt like I didn't deserve this this girl because she's amazing. She's like never kissed a dude, and I've I had never kissed a dude either, but I had kissed a lot of. <laughs> so we had that in common. Uh, but we already talked about that. That was the last question. Uh, but you know what I mean. I thought, man, I don't deserve this. This girl's the best, and I don't deserve her. And that, and that's bad theology too, um, because. Then we go to like a ranking system based on your past, you know, like now you're going to get God's second best or God's third. No, God absolutely has the best future spouse for you, regardless of, of how colorful your past is or how boring your past is or whatever, you know. Um, and so know that God doesn't look down on you. He absolutely loves you and you're a new creation. Amen. Last thing I went with that is I love the story of David and all the situations that David got into. He had an adulterous affair. He killed her husband. He's done all these crazy things. But I think the, the, the thing that I love about David is that God says he was a man after his heart. He was repentive. So when he get into those situations and he did those things, he would repent and say, Father God, I've messed up. I blew up. I blew up bad here. And just please forgive me. And so when we're going through those situations, not that it gives you permission to continually do those things in sin and continually do them, but to be repentant and say, Father God, I messed up. And maybe if that's a situation that you're now married or that you're, that you're, when you get married, that you need to confess to that person or, you know, sometimes you don't need to, but sometimes you just need to go to somebody and say, you know what? I messed up. I need help getting through this situation. I need help getting through my emotions and what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling because, you know, I just don't know how to maneuver through it. But if you just go to Father God and say, God, I blew it. I need help here. And he loves you and he'll be repentant or he will give you forgiveness and you can walk free from that and become a great human being and walk free of that, that sin and that shame. One more thing and I'll let Seth end with this, but had a, had a guy come to me recently and um, just a few weeks ago actually and say, you know, I, when I married my wife, um, she came to me and said, look, we, we have no secrets, right? Yeah, we've got to put it on the table. I want you to know before we, you decide to even go further in this dating relationship that I have genital herpes. And, uh, and if you marry me, you're, you're going to have to live with that the rest of your life. Illicit sexual relationships cause that. So God's not trying to take away our fun. It's not, now this couple's married. They have to deal with that whole issue of that because of, you know, God was, God was trying to take away their fun. No, he's not trying to take away their fun. He's trying to protect you, mm -hmm. protect you or provide for you. And so that just happened to me a couple weeks ago. A guy told me that. So, Yeah, I, I agree completely. I don't think God looks down on you, but I think that it's not God's best for you. Mm -hmm. And when God sets up a, the best and we choose to disobey it, it allows the enemy to come in and, and bring condemnation. And what you think is God coming down on you is really the same enemy that talked you into going there yep. is the same enemy who, once he kicked you down, is going to continue condemn to condemn you mm -hmm. for what he told you was going to be, was going to bring you happiness and love and fulfillment. And um, so, yeah, God, God loves you. Mm -hmm. And if your heart is, um, if your heart is repentive, Come on, you can become pure. Mm -hmm. You know, God can if God can 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 heal uh, a blind eye, He can heal virginity, mm -hmm. right? And so, just know know that it's not God; it's it's just the the enemy trying to.
trying to keep you down That's right. because he's scared of how powerful you really are. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Um, no, the tooth root fairy is not real. Stop <laughs> texting me that. Santa is real. The tooth fairy is not real. And I do love the Blazers. So. But there's been, a, I've been kind of seeing a lot of these guys. Um, people are begging us to keep going. Um, but we've got more sessions to get into. So, um, Maybe do some of the youth group. Yeah. Maybe we can hit some of these and uh, elevate on Wednesday night. Yeah, maybe this Wednesday night. you could. Yeah. We'll answer some more of those questions on Wednesday night. Yeah. Cool. Good. All right. So we have, um, what are we doing? Breakout sessions. So um, we're going to take a, a 10 minute potty break and uh, restroom break. A potty break? <clears throat> um, 10 minute bathroom break. The youth are going to be in here. The youth pastors back there. We'll see you in 10 minutes.